This is the NP Business Matters podcast, episode number six, with Don Self on telehealth coding for clinicians. Welcome to the NP Business Matters podcast. I'm your host, Barbara C. Phillips, nurse practitioner and founder of the Nurse Practitioner, Business Owner, and the Clinician Business Institute, where since 2007, we've been providing education, resources, and support about the business of being a nurse practitioner. To learn more, please visit mpbusiness.com and the cliniciansbusinessinstitute.com. Now, before I get into today's episode, I want to invite you to do three things. First, head on over to iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure that you're subscribed. Secondly, leave your feedback and share the podcast with your colleagues. And finally, visit npbusiness.com forward slash podcasts for the show notes, resources, and links, not only for today's episode, but for all of our episodes. Today, I'm interviewing Don Self. If you've been following MPBO for a while, you may be aware of a webinar that I did with Don this past summer. In that webinar, a lot of eyes were opened as to the amount of money that clinicians are leaving on the table because they are unclear about what they can bill for. In this interview, we'll touch a bit more on that, but the focus for today is on telehealth and appropriate coding in order for you to get paid for your services. Now, in case you are unaware of who Don is, Don Self is a certified coder and a consultant. He's been teaching and consulting with clinicians, coders, and others for the past 35 years and is a wealth of knowledge that he readily shares with us. Now, I want you to pay attention here. One of the things that you'll hear him say, and I quote, right now, even with COVID, if you are in primary care, you should be making more money now than you were making prior to COVID just by a little education, unquote. Don provides that education in this episode of the NP Business Matters podcast. So get ready to take notes now. Don, I am so glad that you're spending some time with me today because obviously you know this stuff in and out better than any clinician out there. And let's talk about telehealth and specifically coding for telehealth. And there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of, um, of truly misunderstanding and a lot of errors that are being made. So um, for instance, just yesterday before this recording, one of the NPs asked a question uh, about coding place of service. Her biller told her it would be fraud for her to charge or to put a place of service of zero two instead of 11. She was not in the office, but she was in a second office. So it wasn't her primary office, but it was a like a satellite office. And, st- and, and seeing the patient on audio video, which is another issue people get mixed up about. So <laughs> yes, ma'am. first of all, can you address this whole issue of place of service? Okay. When the PHE was declared uh, in earlier this year, at that time, Medicare came out and told everybody to use place of service O2 to designate that it was a telehealth service via audio video. And when they did that, they didn't realize that that would automatically throw all services with an O2 into the facility rate rather than the non-facility rate. So at the same time, CMS and Uh, director of CMS, Seema Verma, and everyone was saying, yes, we're going to make sure you get paid the same amount for uh, telehealth as you would if you saw the person in person or the patient in person. We want you to use the O2. They were making a big mistake. Well, the American Osteopathic Association, myself, and several others contacted CMS immediately because we knew what was going to happen. If they use a place of service O2, it reduces the reimbursement down about 37% because they're paying it on an in-facility rate rather than a non-facility ratio. And 
they thought about that and said, oh, crap, we made a mistake. So <laughs> it, was a, it wasn't until March 31st that CMS came out and they issued a directive on their website. And I had the link on my website, by the way, for that. And it said, when billing professional claims for non-traditional telehealth services with dates of service on March 1st or later, for the duration of the public health emergency, they want you to bill with the place of service equal to what it would have been in the absence of a PHE. And basically they're saying, don't use O2, because if you use O2, you're gonna make less money. So if your doctor or a nurse practitioner or PA would have seen a patient last November in the office, then you would have used the place of service 11. Well, that's what they want you to use now. Or if you were a visiting physician or a visiting nurse practitioner service going to the patient's homes and only place you saw patients at, you know, last November and December prior to COVID was in the place, place of service 12 patients' homes and that's what you would use. Mm -hmm. They did not want you to use O2 any longer. Now, some commercial carriers are still telling you to use O2, but I'm going with what Medicare Part B has repeatedly said March 31st, April 6th in their federal register, uh, again on April 14th in an office hours call, and again on August 17th in the federal register. Every one of those have said for Medicare Part B, don't use a place of service O2. Well, some people came back and said, well, um, what if I'm not in the office? What if I'm making this audio video call from home? Well, I'm making an audio video call from some other place. Medicare said it doesn't matter where the provider is right now, not during the COVID emergency, because I know some people might have two offices or something, and that's okay. Uh, or they may be doing it from the hospital bed, a uh, hospital while they're sitting there talking to an audio video of a patient in the patient's home. So Medicare has again said on April 6th in the Federal Register uh, that they do not care where the provider is when the audio video call is being made, you code it the way you would have last year with the place of service and the appropriate e &M code. Does that make sense? It makes sense. So if I see patients in assisted living, but now I'm doing telehealth, I'm going to use that place of service. Yes, and if I see people in the office, I would use that place of service. Exactly. Like I like to give an example of, let's say we have a nurse practitioner that prior to COVID did office visits and home visits but they didn't do hospital. Mm -hmm. But yet they're talking to a patient on an audio video in the patient's home, then they would use a place of service 12. Okay, because they used to go to the patient's homes prior to COVID. But if they're talking to a patient in an assisted living or the hospital, then they would use a place of service 11 for the office because they did not go to the hospital or the assisted living prior to COVID so they'll still use the same place of service codes they were using before. And so, that makes things simpler. Yeah, it does make it simpler. There should be no confusion. If this is where I normally see the patient, this is where I would code as my place of service. Yes, ma'am. See, I think part of the problem is that you have what I call purist coders. Now, I'm a certified coder, and but I'm not what you would call a purist coder. A purist coder is somebody that I believe that follows the AMA CPT code book no matter what. Well, that's not very realistic because each carrier can make up their own rules like Medicare has. And a purist coder is going to be running into a complication if they sit there and say, well, O2 is what it has in the CPT code book for telehealth. Well, Medicare says, if you want our money, you have to do what we're telling you, not what the CPT, which is a private association of doctors. They're not the government. They're not the ones who get to make the final decisions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like modifier 95. Medicare wants you to use a 95 now with the current place of service that you're using. And that tells Medicare that you did not get in the car and drive to the patient or the patient did not get on their bicycle and drive to you or whatever. Mm -hmm. It means it was done via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And then purist coders say, well, wait a minute. A 95 says it was done via interactive audio video real time. But what if a doctor is doing an annual wellness visit with a patient over a telephone? That's not audio video, so we shouldn't use 95. 
Medicare says, yes, if you want to get our money, you're going to use a 95 because that's what we're telling you. So forget anything that the American Medical Association may have told you on a CPT code because we don't care. We're CMS. We make up our own rules. And each commercial carrier is making up their own rules now. So it becomes very confusing for a lot of people, obviously. Yes, ma'am. So, there is no one set of rules that fits everybody. Okay. So so Medicare, we know that a lot of people fall in step with Medicare eventually. Yes, ma'am. And they have since about 1989 when Medicare started telling doctors how much they could charge. And that got all the commercial carriers' interest. They said, what? You can tell private businesses how much they can charge? And at that time, Medicare became the leader. And prior to that, Medicare was following all the commercials. And now everybody follows Medicare. Everybody eventually. follows Medicare. So, but still, if your commercial carrier is telling you to use a, modi a modifier or not yeah. use a modifier, you still need to follow what, say, Blue Cross says versus what CMS says. Whoever's exactly. paying you, you follow their rules. If you want their money, you'll follow their rules. Follow he who rules. has a gold makes the rules. <laughs> so then in, in terms of the modifier, you're always using that modifier if it is a telehealth visit, an audio video visit. If True. it's an, well, not just audio video, but yes, if it's audio video, yes, ma'am, you will use a 95. But there will be times when you'll use that 95 modifier when it wasn't done via audio video. But because Medicare has given certain number of codes, or have, they have right now, I uh, believe it's like 91 codes that the Medicare will pay for, for audio only. And it's not just regular telephone calls. Some of those audio onlys might be um, psychiatric uh, counseling. It might be group psychotherapy. It might be, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. It might be Medicare annual wellness visits. It might be uh, 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 depression screening, uh, uh, alcohol misuse screening. It might be uh, end of life decisions, advanced care planning. There's a whole bunch of like 91 codes that can be done via telephone only. So the only way Medicare would know that you did that via some kind of a communication format would be a 95. Because if you don't throw a 95 on there, Medicare is going to assume that you were face to face with the patient. So that's what the 95 is being used by CMS and Medicare, even though the AMA CPT code book has a different definition. A different definition. And I yes, think that that's where so much of it comes from. You know, I was certainly taught for many years that that was the gold standard to follow. Always follow the CPT manual. But obviously, that's not necessarily the case. That'll get you into trouble. Oh, I mean, and this is just one of many examples. For instance, it's amazing how many certified coders. And I do a lot of seminars in the last, in the last four months or five months, I've done around 29 uh, webinars, live webinars to different AAPC coding chapters around the country on different issues. So I'm very in tune with what these coders know and what they're needing to know. And it's amazing how many do not even know that there's a different set of rules for global fee period from CPT and Medicare. Or uh, how many times Medicare will pay for one thing and CPT says, oh, no, you do something different. There's a, a myriad, I could do an entire webinar on nothing but the differences between AMA, CPT, and Medicare. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So that, so for the provider who's trying to figure out how to code, it's going to, it can get a little bit um, crazy. Oh, yes, ma'am. And thank God it does, because that gives, has given me a great job security for the last 35 years. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So... When, when um, you, you talked about the telephone codes, um, and again, you're still going to use the place of service of where you are, yes, where you normally would see. So if I was to call you up to talk about whatever, yes, um, even going over your lab work, that kind of thing, I would still use the place of service of, say, 11, and I would put that modifier 95 on there. 
Well, if it's a simple telephone call code only, like a 994442 and 99443, which is a telephone call, then okay. a 95 is not needed because the code itself says it was done via telephone. Okay, so it would need to be one of those other things, like like you said, with end of life for advanced care planning. Exactly. One of those codes is not normally done via telephone, and that tells Medicare that this is not a traditional okay. telephone call. But say if you call me up and say, okay, Don, we're going to spend uh, 12 minutes and, and you spend 12 minutes going over my lab test results and what kind of changes I need to make in my lifestyle because you're making adjustments to my blood thinner or whatever, then you're just going to bail out that as a 99442 with no modifier needed. And you would still use a place of service 11, regardless if you do that from the office or you do that while you're sitting at home on your couch or you do that at the golf course drinking a beer. It doesn't matter where you are. And it doesn't really matter where the patient is. Okay. The patient can be at home, the hospital, or the, uh, the laundromat, doesn't matter. Okay, all right. So then one of the things that, that um, uh, just popped up for me, we're, we're talking about those codes and yet commercial insurances have different rules. Are they generally covering also the telephone calls? They have been. Now, uh, they, they didn't really start paying for the telephone calls until Medicare did. And that wasn't until, I believe, April 6th when Medicare started doing paying for telephone calls, even though the telephone call codes have been around since 2016. So they're not new codes. It's just Medicare didn't cover them until then. And some commercial carriers have jumped on real quick. Some jumped on temporarily, uh, but every carrier is making a difference, uh, has a different set of rules. There's one website that I absolutely love. Uh, it's the Association of Health Insurance Providers, and they've got a website. I'm gonna uh, give you the link on that right there that providers can go to and then check with each individual carrier individually and find out what each carrier wants, and it's all alphabetized. So you click on the A's, and you're going to see what Aetna wants, or the B, and see what Blue Cross wants, or Blue Shield wants. Like in California, I believe there are two different carriers. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of the country, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the same. Uh, or the well, C is Actually, Sigma. Washington, for instance, uh -huh. Blue Cross is Primera and Regent. So there's two. Ah, okay. What's that? In, in Washington. So if I went to the B's and went to Blue Cross, I could see both of those chapters for a better word. Exactly. Okay, now that excellent. website is www.ahip.org. Ahip.org. Oh my goodness. I wish I'd known about that website a long time ago. It's a really cool website. Now, I also have the entire link that takes you to the COVID page, but it's it's like 94 characters. So rather than calling it out right now, if they just go to you, I'll send that to you and you can put that on your page or people can visit donself.com and, and mm -hmm. see it there also. But I'm going to send that to you while I'm thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll also be putting all the links and resources we talk about um, below both the podcast and the video. Okay, cool. So so everyone will have access to those and, and certainly to your information as well. We talked about the public health emergency and, and all of these things. Now, I personally don't believe that telehealth will ever go back into the closet, but how long do you anticipate that these things may stay in effect? You know, right now with the public health emergencies, nurse practitioners can do a little bit more in terms of like signing home health finally. finally. Um, yeah. Amen. And that's permanent. Oh, that's permanent. Perfect. Oh, that's permanent. Medicare came out and said that on April, I believe it was 12th or 13th, something like that. I, I can tell you exactly here because I've got it. Uh, that was on May 7th. Medicare came out and said this is a permanent change. And it's well overdue, but it is. I'm excited about that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, the the less restrictions we have on being able to provide care, the the better. Um, so, 
in terms of then the PHE and well, just the telehealth stuff right now how is is some of that looking permanent i know we're going to talk later about the changes for 2021 but are can we anticipate that the telehealth rules and the coding will stay the same oh you can definitely anticipate that for a couple of reasons on march 30 no uh april on april 1st seema verma the director of cms and you know, CMS is over Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE. And the director of CMS came out and said that uh, they, will, they will find a way to continue paying to telehealth even after the PHE is over. She says, hopefully Congress will give us the money to do so, but if not, she's been instructed by President Trump to find a way to pay for it because she and the the president both are strongly in favor of it. So that's one thing that's not gonna, they're not gonna be able to put that back into the toothpaste tube. Okay, it's out, it ain't going back in. Right, right. And then I believe it was on August uh, 17th, Federal Register that they came out and reiterated that once more. Uh, so I really believe that we've got telehealth now. Will they continue to pay for it as much as they're paying now? Or for as many ver uh, variations with the patient being at home? That we don't know. And we won't know until PHE is over. Then that may be another six months. That may be another three months. It might be another year. This might be yeah. become our new normal. I have no idea. Right. Uh, I don't follow the Ouija board. And uh, right. the Lord hadn't told me yet. So I don't know how long this will last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think any of us do. It's it's not going away anytime soon. So as um, as we're looking at these things, one of the things that I would like to bring up, um, we talked before, and and in our last webinar that we did with you, you also mentioned about nurse practitioners not really billing Medicare to the full to the full extent that they could that they were really leaving a lot of money on the table and and that happens obviously for a lot of reasons with the data that you're able to pull up i mean many nurse practitioners um, they're having to bill incident too. For instance, I went to go establish care with a nurse practitioner in my community and she told me she was not able to be my primary that it's um, against the law. Um, and yet at another clinic, a friend of mine has a primary who's a nurse practitioner. So, you know, I can go see her, but I also have to see the physician every other visit. And that's an internal policy for that that's particular internal clinic. policy. But what happens with that, then what you're probably seeing is that that NP has to bill incident two. I mean, obviously not on the visit I did because you know, she didn't see, I, I didn't see the physician first who established the plan and da, 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 da. But I think a lot of data gets lost because of incident two. Oh, I agree. And, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about something that President Trump did August, I mean, October 3rd of 2019 in an executive order. He told the director of health and human services or the secretary of health and human services, he wanted nurse practitioners and PAs to be paid the same amount as physicians if they're doing the same work. Mm -hmm. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Now, again, from what I understand, it was on uh, August 5th of this year, he signed another executive order. And in that he reiterated, he wants that to take place. So I really believe, and it, a lot of it's going to depend upon the election and everything that's going on, but I really believe that that's coming. I just, I wish it had already gotten here. Right. Right. Uh, so to a lot of nurse practitioners and PAs, um, especially those that have, have their own practices. But um, getting back to what nurse practitioners can potentially um, really generate for their practices, since a, a lot of the NPs that I work with do own their own practices. Yes, ma'am. Um, and they're obviously not billing incident to, they can't, they, they own the practice. But um what are some of the things that they're leaving on the table and that they could be doing? I mean, we've talked before about remote patient monitoring. We've talked just about, even with 
with Medicare and some of the carriers, just the things that are re- that they say you should be doing this, just standard of care. Well, you know, it's really sad that so many, it's not just nurse practitioners and PAs, but it's physicians also, but all providers do not realize, uh, the vast majority of the providers do not realize that Medicare patients are the most profitable of any patients that they can see. And because of that, they're missing out so much money. I mean, if I pull up right here in the state of Washington, for instance, and look at the nurse practitioners average in the country, and I know some of them are, or in the state of Washington, I know some of them are independent working for themselves, and some of them are working incident to as an employee, et cetera. But the average is around $150 to $160 a year per patient that they're making for Medicare where if they're working independent, they should be generating over $1,300 a year in actual Medicare payments, not counting the 20% co-insurance or the co-pay, the co-insurance that the patient or the secondary pays, just in the actual Medicare payment should be over $1,330 a year per Medicare patient. And yet they're averaging $200. Like I'm looking at one right here in Bremerton, they're averaging 284. And based on their code, I would say that this particular practice right here uh, is probably independent. But what are they missing? Well, it's amazing that so many providers, and again, not just nurse practitioners, but the others as well, are not billing out for destruction of AK properly. They're billing out for the first one, or they're telling the billing people that I, I took off four pre-malignant lesions, so I burned off four, I froze off four, and yet the billing person only bills out for one for the primary and maybe one extra instead of all four because they don't know about the proper coding. It's amazing how many times I'm talking to nurse practitioners in the last two weeks that do not understand that whenever they have a MA or someone go in and try to irrigate the ears out because of impacted wax and they don't get all of it out and they, the nurse practitioner then has to go in with a curette or a spoon or a barbecue tongs, whatever they're reaching into the ear for with and pull the wax out that they can build for both the 69209 and the 69210. They think, well, I can only bill for one or the other, but yet if you look at the NCCI edits, it says if both was done, both is medically necessary, then you can bill for both. But that's just a couple of the examples. You brought up the advanced care planning a few minutes ago. It's a sad how many providers do not even billing out for the advanced care planning. And Medicare pays 100% of that code 99497 if it was done on the same day as the annual wellness visits. And if we even just break down the annual wellness visits themselves, most of the Medicare providers I'm looking at right here on this list, I'm, and again, I have everybody's billing record in the country, so I know what they're, that they've been billing in the past. Most of them are making like $112 for an annual wellness visit or $109 instead of what they should be making. But if they're doing the cognitive testing and they're doing cognitive assessment planning, they're doing the advanced care planning and they're doing the depression screening and the alcohol misuse screening and the cardiac therapy. And they're doing the services that Medicare expects the patients to get. They should be generating even at the 85% level, taking the 15% hit, they should be generating over $370 in Medicare payments. And most of that Medicare pays 100% for Now, if they're then doing cognitive assessment planning, that adds on another $200 to it. So it's the the list of things that most providers are missing out on is astounding. And they sit there and wonder why they're struggling. And it's not because they're ignorant. Well, it's not because they're stupid. It's because they don't know what they're missing. Right. And they're not alone. Every provider, primary care provider in the country, and, and even the ones that's been practicing for 20 or 30 years, they're averaging $300 to $400 a year per patient instead of the $1,300 to $1,700 that they should be getting mm-hmm. by now, doing when, what Medicare when you're wants. Talk- I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Talk over you. When, when you're talking that thirteen to $1,700, you are talking primary care, internal medicine type of practices, correct? Yes, ma'am, I am. And that's the vast majority of the ones that I work with. Because I'm kind of a specialist on primary care. Okay. And primary care can be delivered in the home as well, 
oh, or yes, in an assisted living facility. So all of those places where you can do these services, we're seeing less than what people should expect to get because exactly. they don't know. Much less. I mean, I was talking to a uh, assist, I mean, a, a home visiting nurse practitioner service out in Abilene, uh, Texas area. And that's all they do is they go to the home and they've got several nurse practitioners and one physician, I believe, that goes into the patient's home. And I was sitting there th taking a look at their codes. All they were billing for was a home visit. I said, well, do you ever do anything else while you're in there? Like draw the blood to send off to the lab? Well, yeah, but you're not billing for that. Do you ever clean out a patient's ears in the patient's home rather than referring the patient to an otolaryngologist? And they said every day. I said, but you're not billing for that. Do you ever treat bed sores? Well, yeah, and wounds, uh-huh. But they're not billing for that. And I mean, it's only because they have no idea and they're surviving on E&M codes alone and missing a fortune on the side. That is so sad. Yes, ma'am, it is. That, that is sad because I do hear about practices and not just NP practices, but physician practices and PA practices as well that do struggle. They yes, do struggle. So, you, you know, a, if, if that NP, if that clinician doesn't know what are some, and their coder doesn't know, their biller doesn't know, what what is some of the best things that a clinician can do? Well, you obviously, mean, uh, come talk to you. But that was going to be my first answer, right there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, ask around to the other 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 nurse practitioners and other clinicians and say, "What are you billing for?" I mean, people sit there and think, "Well, it's illegal for me to talk billing questions with other practices." No, it's not. There are so many things that we think that is illegal that it's not. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's sad. I can never charge anyone less than Medicare. Uh, there's no law that says that. I can never give a discount to a, a cash paying patient. No, there's no law saying you can't. There's a lot of things we think that they can't do. But talking to others about billing questions, they can do that. They can attend webinars. They can, uh, uh, obviously, my first question, my first thought is they can call me and schedule a time to spend an hour with me because my philosophy is real, diff real different than most people. After I've spent an hour with a provider, uh, I'm going to ask that provider, do you believe I just helped you increase your income by 20000 a year? And if you say yes, then you can pay me for that hour we just spent. But if you say no, you don't owe me a penny. It's kind of strange philosophy, but it's worked for me for 35 years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because there's and, so much out there. Yeah, yeah. And yes. on average, um, on average, when you spend that hour with a clinician and um, and you ask them that question, how much are you actually showing them? Because I believed before you we were talking about it and, you know, you just used the 20,000. But in many cases, it's so much more. Yes, ma'am. The truth of the matter is it's usually between 70000 and 170000 a year increase that they're going to get. Now, you sit there and say, well, why don't you tell them that from the beginning? Because it, then it would be unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It would and be unbelievable. For, yes, ma'am. So if I just say, if I'm only going to charge you, if you think I've helped you make 20000 but yet so many are missing so many things because they're not billing out for everything. Uh, I just did an analysis of a bunch of clients in one state, well, Idaho, and it turned out that everybody in this one little town, while I was doing a seminar and I was doing their review of what they've been billing out before I did this, I like to look at, at that for that particular town when I go to do a webinar for a town. And this was in Boise, Idaho, and they were all billing out the same codes and missing the same codes. For instance, on every EKG they were doing in their offices, they were only billing out for the enter code, 93010, and making $8 instead of billing 93000 and making $17. It's because there had been a local seminar there in 2008, and they were told in that local seminar, oh, this is how we bill it. And then in that same town, I was looking and said, okay, why is it nobody is billing out 69209? 
for the, you know, independently, left ear and right ear, be two different charges. And there was a seminar last year that they would all attend, and they said, oh, we were told 69209 is only once per patient. And yet everybody in that town that had been at that seminar and passing the word on to other coders were passing on bad information. Right. And it's so sad because, because some consultant goes in there and gives them bad information, everybody was getting screwed. Mm-hmm. And at a time when they're hurting for money and trying to figure out how can I get a loan from the government to keep my doors open. Right now, even with COVID, if you're in primary care, you should be making more money now than you were making prior to COVID just by a little education. Mm -hmm. There's not one primary care provider that should be having to go borrow money from the government to keep their doors open because there's so many things you can do via telemedicine and things you can do via uh, telephone calls that you don't even know about. Yeah, and I think that that's the thing, you know, we always hear this phrase, you don't know what you don't know. And this is, and, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on to the podcast and another reason that we're doing a webinar next month, but is to really educate providers these, these small primary care practices, these, um, uh, you know, home care practices, just what they can do because they're doing good work, but they need to capture it. Amen. I mean, if I'm going to look for a primary care provider, I'm personally going to look for a nurse practitioner. Why? Because they're going to take the time to listen to me. They're not going to try to rush me through. And they're going to take, you know, yeah, they may only see 17 patients a day. In, in primary care and nurse practitioner, or they may only see 15. But yet I know even seeing 15, they're going to make more money than that MD or DO that's trying to see 30 patients a day because they're going to figure out, oh, I'm going to listen to this patient, see what they need. I'm going to order this right here. I'm going to do this service for them rather than trying to rely on E&M codes only. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why their total, you know, their net income is going to be so much greater if they're working smart. The problem is so many providers are trying to work hard. And those are the ones that by the time they're 52 years old, they're going through burnout sometime between 52 and 55 years old. You and I have both seen that happen how many times? <laughs> because they didn't know what they didn't know. And they were working hard to try to keep the doors open rather than working smart. Right. And, and working hard because that's what we've seen. That's what we've been taught. Yes, ma'am. You know, we haven't been taught how we can work smarter. So when, when you know, for the NP who doesn't know, yes, they can come and, and sit down and talk with you. But is there also, you know, even for, I mean, I've talked to you now several times. And I'm still in my head going, wait a minute, this, this, you know, it, it gets a little confusing because there's so much yes, that ma'am. you can do on your website or when you work with someone, do, do you also have some kind of a list for them or? Well, I have a monthly newsletter I've been doing since 1988, uh, eight page yeah. newsletter that I have a couple of thousand people in the country subscribe to for and that's like eight bucks a month, $99 a year is what it breaks out to be in. And then I've got a website that's had a little bit over six and a half million visits, domself.com, right. that has all kinds of free information. I have free little 10 minute webinars all throughout it, as well as articles I've written that's in there. But just the whole idea is just be careful who you go to and who you trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if anyone ever tells you you can't do something, make them prove it. I mean, it's amazing how many people believe the rules exist that don't exist. Okay, if you go outside, you're going to catch a cold. Uh, if it's raining or you can't go swimming for 30 minutes after you eat. Uh, let me see. I, I, my pool I had when I was growing up was about three feet deep. Uh, and I don't think cramps was going to make me, you know, there's just so much things out there that you we believe that's just not true. So be careful. Right. Anytime somebody gives you something, make sure you check the, the source documents. And a newsletter uh, saying Don Self said this or uh, uh, Barbara Phillips said this right here is not going to help help you if you get in trouble. Look for the source data from CMS or from Medicare 
mm-hmm. and find out from them because I really honestly don't care what the AMA says. What does Medicare says? What does Cigna say on their policies? What does the Blue Cross policy say? Mm-hmm. And check with those because they're the ones that's going to get you in trouble if you're not following the rules. Oh my goodness, that is so true. Going going back to the source. And and one of the things you had mentioned, talk to the people around you. Yes, ma'am. I would be very careful with that again, <laughs> checking the source. <laughs> and 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 the and the reason that I say that is, you know, we have um, we have a, a private Facebook group, but there's also a public Facebook group that has about eight thousand members in it right now of nurse practitioners either in business or getting started in business. And, you know, one of the things that I say in the beginning is do your due diligence because we see misinformation being passed on. Oh, amen. And, and you really do have to, to go find the documents, as you said, um, hit up an expert, a true expert, and still look for the documentation just to keep yourself safe. Yeah, it's it's never been, you, you know, you can go to court, you can go before the board, and it's never been that um, you will be able to say, oh, I didn't know that as a defense. No, and saying I did not know is not a good defense. So everybody else was doing it is not a good defense. Yeah. Uh, either one. Uh, you just got to be very careful out there. And it's it, not everybody has all the answers. For instance, let's say you work in urology and you come and ask me questions. I'm going to sit there and say, hey, look, that's not my specialty. I might be able to find someone that is that knows about that. Well, if you came to me and you're in cardiology, I'm going to say, well, Terry Fletcher out of California is probably the best on, on cardiology. If you and coming in with psychiatry quest, billing questions and coding questions. I'm going to sit there and say, oh, you probably want Sean Weiss with doctor's management. You say, well, aren't these people your competitors? Well, yeah, they are. I mean, doctor's management has 81 different consultants out there, and I'm just by myself. But I tried to figure it out, and I figured out 35 years ago, if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to BS people. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know, because people appreciate the honesty. But then I'll try to find out who does know the answer. Because there's others out there that's much better at different areas than I am. People sit there and say, I want somebody in policy and procedures to help me write a manual. I'll sit there and say, wow, I've got about three different people that's wonderful at that that I know that I'll refer you to. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you don't know, don't be afraid to admit that too. That's the one thing I do when I'm mentoring people. And I've mentored consultants for 30 something years now. If you don't know, tell them you don't know because you owe them that. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm old-fashioned, ma'am. I live by, well, I call it the cowboy creed. You know, there ain't never a time in the world that it's right to hit a woman. And if you see somebody in help, you go help them, no matter what it takes. And the third one is, you always tell the truth because as Judge Judy says, if you always tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. That one is so true. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a good liar. Never. My no. wife was telling my grandson yesterday when, when I was pulling his leg on something, she said, look at grandpa's bottom lip because when he's lying, you can tell because it kind of quivers. <laughs> Everybody's got a tail and that's my tail, which is why I'm not any good at poker. Yeah. <laughs> I have really appreciated all this information on coding, particularly for for telehealth and a few other things. But I want to also remind people, and I'll have links for all of this again, too, is that we're going to do a webinar in on NP week this year, November 11th. And we're going to talk about some of the changes that are happening in Medicare. Um, is that right, Medicare, or is it just in the federal register for the coming year? Well, it's going to affect Medicare and some of the things that are going to be affecting commercial carriers as well, because the AMA is changing the definition that we've had for 19, uh, well, no, we've had for 24 years on uh, E&M coding. Since 1997, we've had a set of rules. 
and AMA is the changing definition on medical decision making on some things. Medicare is changing how they're going to be, uh, what they're going to require for documentation for office visits, but not for home visits and not for hospital visits. So there's all kinds of changes coming up. Right. So it's really important for those of you listening before November 11th to yeah. go ahead and sign up. So on Veterans Day, we are, we're going to have a good time there, gal, because better, you know, uh, November 11th is a, a special day. Yes. Okay. Yes. In a way. And one thing you didn't ask me about, but one thing that you may want, we may want to seriously consider having a future webinar on is ERISA. Have we already talked about ERISA? No, you and I? I don't think we have. ERISA is a law that's been around since 1974, and it affects more than 80% of all providers' claims. It's not Medicare or Medicaid. And it gives the provider a whole lot of power that I would say about 94% of providers, nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians or clinicians do not even know. And the sad thing is about 94% of dealers and coders and office managers don't know anything about it either. Mm -hmm. And it will stop insurance carriers from recouping on all of these you know, notifications you get saying, hey, we paid you six months ago, or a year ago, we want money back. Legally, you don't have to give them the money back according to the United States Supreme Court. And it helps you to make sure that the carriers are paying properly and not denying things. So that's a whole nother subject that we should talk about that I've been teaching on for about 21 years. We absolutely should. Absolutely. I know. Um, uh, now, does this include Medicaid and Medicare and all the rest? No, I mean, it, can, it doesn't uh, affect Medicare and Medicaid. It only affects commercial insurance claims okay. when the patient's insurance was provided to an employer. Okay. Well, 70, 70, 78% of insurance that we have today is provided by employers. I know people talk about the PPACA and Obamacare and the ACA Act and all that, but that's not the majority of insurance. That's only about 22% of people that have insurance got it through the PPACA. About 78% of people got their insurance to an employer. And this affects every one of those. Well, that's definitely one that we need to um, schedule because I think every single provider has been in that situation where insurance companies, including Medicare and Medicaid, have come back. Several years ago, Washington State Medicaid apparently did an audit and went through and demanded all this money back from people in the tens of thousands um, for visits that they said were no longer covered. And uh, I myself have had uh, money taken back, um, you know, going back five, seven years. So yes, definitely. Let's plan on that, Don. So I have a hundred percent success rate on that, by the way, uh, with commercial. Great, great. So all of you listening, you have another reason to stay tuned and to follow us. <laughs> So thank you so much, Don, for this time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's always fun to talk to you, Barbara, and you asked some great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you learned a lot from that episode, and I want to thank Don for taking time out today to share his wisdom and knowledge on coding. Make sure that you take the time out to head over to npbusiness.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find the show notes for today's episode, as well as the resources, links, and contact information. And while you're there, make sure that you sign up for the November 11th webinar on the 2021 changes that we can expect from CMS and other commercial payers. This has been Barbara C. Phillips, nurse practitioner and founder of npbusiness.com and the cliniciansinstitute.com, where we provide education, resources, and support for NPs and other clinicians on the topic on the business of healthcare, practice, business startup, and more. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend time with me today. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the NP Business Matters podcast. Bye-bye now.